Today's stream is going to be about a uh, number of uh, macroeconomic indicators and my thoughts that people aren't really talking about right now, uh, but I believe need to be covered. And it's pretty, pretty optimistic, in my opinion. I think you guys are going to like this one. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to get started here. So the Fear and Greed Index is the first one I want to uh, talk to. This I'm actually getting excited about. You can see how within here... We had extreme fear at the beginning of 2023 still. I was I was already up a decent amount in Meta and Tesla by this point, but there was still a ton of fear in the market, so not everything was running. Uh, most, most people were scared to death still around this time in March. But you could see how once the market started to go, it went too. And so we actually saw went from extreme fear, the edge of it, all the way up to extreme greed, and then just hovered there. And like, like technical charts, you could see where it tried to go higher and then eventually just broke down. And that's just a very clean pattern when you're looking at charting. And then you can see how we wrote it down, got a little bit of excitement, wrote it down. Pretty standard stuff. Greed goes down, fear kicks in, following the markets, right? And what they're doing. And then the same way to the upside, October, latter part of October, things got better. Going all the way into January, we're in extreme greed here. Now, what's interesting now that I'm finding and what I'm really liking is that we're seeing this downward trend and and greed where we were in extreme and then we we've had some uh, you know some a little bit of a route here but it was small and short lived and now we're starting to climb back up and the thing I love about this is we're actually starting to have kind of a bullish divergence here where the greed is going down or staying moderate and at the same time we're establishing all time highs and you know the Dow Jones and uh, S and P and Nasdaq and a number of other indices. So I think this is very bullish. I think it's a bullish sign and I'm excited about it. I think it at least like uh, Tom Lee was talking about, I think he said maybe 51 to 5,200 on the S&P is possible. I'm, I'm agreeing with that. I think that, I think that we're going to get there. I actually think S&P 6,000 is possible by the end of the year, but we'll see what happens here. Next talking point, the Warren Buffett indicator. So this has been around for a while. Some people say it can't be used anymore. I actually think it can. Uh, I know in some of the people inside of here too, we're talking about how this isn't totally reliable because there's the market has been doing better and the market caps have been climbing because they're making so much money overseas, but that actually should be getting counted into GDP because these companies are still producing and we're still, we're still getting growth here, irregardless of the source of where we're making that. And we definitely are getting a lot of assistance from working with international markets and selling into them. So there's that that part is true, but I would argue that since the late 70s, when we left the gold standard, that's really when this broke. And and again, so you can't you can't look at this and just say, oh, okay, well the total market cap per, uh, versus the percent of GDP shows that you know oh we can't get above 150 percent because that's what happened in the dot com bubble, and then it, and then we melted down. Because if you look, you'll see that we didn't get that high in 2008. Again, there was another issue there. We had a real estate bubble. Uh, we had adjustable rate mortgages that were like one to three years, and then they defaulted to super high rates, and then everybody just imploded because people were buying houses and flipping them, and it was just a disaster. That time was just nuts. Nothing like today. Way worse. Worse than commercial real estate. Um, it was just not a good situation. But my whole point here is that we got this new median now, and so we're, if you if you go through here, I actually would argue that we were overextended in 2021 after the money printing in the market. So the total market cap versus what G, GDP was producing. But now GDP is climbing and our, we've climbed a little bit in here. And this is current uh, data. I think it goes all the way to February. But but at the same time, I would argue that that uh, I think we're actually a lot closer to the midline and that we have a long ways to go. I think this could go up to plus 200 percent maybe even 230 or 250 before it would be anything like what we saw in the dot-com bubble um i'd say at least 250 and here's the thing uh gdp is going up it's we're we're aggressively looking and adjusting higher i mean caleb was just talking about this the other day caleb franzen follow him on x if you're not already um i argue back and forth with him every once in a while i'm probably a pain in his ass but he's a good dude so, so check that out. But like, again, revisions just keep going higher uh, with the Fed and the GDP. And it, that's a positive thing. And so I actually think you could still use this indicator, the Warren Buffett indicator, but you need to draw it with this line so that you're factoring in uh, the money printing that's going on and the fact that 
people are going to put that money in. I mean, they're going to put it in Bitcoin now, now a lot of it in Bitcoin, but previously it was stocks and real estate. And so, of course, you're going to see this get higher and higher and higher. All right. Uh, business and auto loans. So this, this one right here is U.S. loans and leases and bank and credit by type. And what I wanted to cover here is you'll see that business and auto loans are trending down since 2022, 2023, uh, into 2022, pretty much. And you'll see that commercial real estate loans, credit card and revolving loans, and residential real estate have slowly been trickling up. And credit cards have actually been going up more. My argument here is that this is done by billions. So this is deceptive. I actually think that credit cards and commercial real estate and uh, residential real estate loans, they have such high interest rates and high debt balances on them that they look like they're being productive and growing. And what they're probably doing is flat to down just because their people are paying so much more than they did before. So this isn't an indication of, of recovery or strength. It's, it's uh, if, if anything, it's just flat. And these other areas are probably even steeper down, like auto and business loans. So this is me again saying the Fed needs to lower rates in March. And I think they're going to I think they're going to do that. Um, I think they're going to do that for a number of reasons. One, if we go over to the CME uh, Fed watch tool, you could see that in March they've actually adjusted this now. Uh, Friday, like open, I think we were in the low 20s. Now we're already back up to 38 percent for a, for a uh, lowering in March. And in May, we're looking at 25 bips is almost 60%, and 50 bips is 34.2. So there's only a 6.2% chance that we don't lower in May. So I think, again, I think the Fed's going to be smart. I think they're talking tough, but I think they're going to be dragging us down in, in rates, and I think that's going to benefit everybody. Now, to the auto loan part. Elon, for a, you know the last couple of years almost, has been saying the economy is bad. We're preparing for that. Tesla's, we need to lower prices on Tesla's because it's going to be needed if we're going to be able to succeed in the future. And he has been hella on to the, he's gotten so much shib about that, but he's, he's right. He's a hundred percent right. If you look at this chart of auto loan tightening standards versus demand since the late 2021, mid, I'm sorry, mid 2021, you can see how demand has plummeted while tightening has 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 increased so the banks are tightening their credit standards the number of people that are interested in buying a vehicle is going down because they don't want to pay these crazy rates or they can't even afford them anymore and they're just losing their cars so and i know people this is even happening too so this is like a very real thing and this is why this is going to be a drag on tesla guys i'm going to do a quick segue into tesla this will hurt them this will hurt them because the dollar is actually seeing strength. I'm going to post that in here. Oh, that's a horrible view. Let me adjust. The dollar is getting stronger. It just broke above the 200 moving average. It has bullish divergence and convergence on both the RSI and the MACD. And this is going to create headwinds potentially for the stock market, but definitely for companies that do business overseas and do a lot of sales because they won't get as much money for the stuff that they're selling because the dollar is stronger. So that sucks for them. And so Enphase, um, Tesla, and Apple, Apple's been getting smoked. All these companies that sell overseas that have a lot of sales over there, they're going to feel this pain on top of the domestic pain they're feeling from high rates. And you can see that with Tesla in other ways. If you look at energy storage deployed since about late 2022, you can see they've topped out and they're trending down. Solar generation deployed, you can see they topped out in second quarter of 2022 and it's going down. Profit per vehicle, Elon was right. He's had to lower the, they, they've done a great job, great job. Jeff Letts talks about this a lot. He loves the manufacturing thing. Lowering cogs per vehicle, as you can see over here, and increasing margins. They've done a great job doing all of this stuff to get their balance sheet in order and continue to just be the engineering powerhouse of the world. I, I love Tesla so much and Elon Musk for what they've been doing and what they will do in the future. But profits per vehicle sucks, and it, it probably is going to continue to suck because they have to be able to keep selling. And I sold, said this a while ago, and not everybody agreed with me, but I said they will destroy margins to keep producing because they want to grow. 
and they have a, such a massive cash balance sheet, it doesn't even matter. Look at this cash to debt right here in the middle of the screen. They have so much cash right now and so little debt, it doesn't matter. These guys, look at the operating, look at the revenues versus their operating expenses. This is just, these guys, these guys will do fine in the future. Here's the thing I caution on. They won't do well now, at least for another month or so. We need to start seeing rates coming down for, for even this, for anybody to get optimistic about the stock. Um, until then, it's probably not going to be a lot of fun. And I, I've started buying calls, but they're June 2026. And it allows me to put a small amount of money to make, you know, four to six, eight X in the future in the next couple of years if Tesla does well with a very small amount of capital. So I could put 30 or 40 in and I could have, you know, 250,000. And so it's a way for me to leverage in, but not waste all that money with the time suck of, of being like, oh, it's not going anywhere. It's going down to sideways. If that happens, I'll just buy more and give myself two and a half years for it to perform. I would also caution, I'll get off this Tesla subject and we'll get back into macro. If you are buying options, please to God, don't do anything less than a year. Again, this isn't financial advice, but I'm just talking to my own personal experiences here. I'm not a financial advisor. You, you're, you're big boys and girls. You guys got to take care of yourself. But from my experience, and it, with that options video I showed, I'll throw that at the end of this, you get crushed by theta decay if you do less than a year. You do. It's not worth it. Buy yourself time. You want to gather the extrinsic and intrinsic value with options. You don't want to wait until the end and increase your odds of getting screwed. This hurts people. It hurts people. I've done this. Don't be the person doing zero day, weekly, monthly. Don't do that. You're just destroying your chances for success. Timing is the hardest part of options. Give yourself as much grace as you can. Be smart. Don't be a fool. All right, I'm done with my rant. Let's move on. All right, off the auto stuff, kind of. All right, now we're looking at uh, U.S. transition into severe delinquency. Severe delinquency is over 90 days late. And we're covering um, mortgage, credit card, student loan, and auto here. And also, we're reflecting total debt balance, which is an important part of this. So more recently here, and this is delayed data. I'm trying to find better data. If you guys know of any, please shoot me a source in the comments and or post something in X and let me know. But this is from July. I can't find anything more recent. I'm, I'm still looking, though. But you can see the bears love the fact that credit card delinquencies were going up pretty steep and that we were seeing auto loan delinquencies increasing, too. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if these are a little higher than they are today. But there's some things I want to point out. One, debt balance today, even with those things factored in, is way lower than we ever saw in 2006 at the lows. That is important. I also don't think that we're going to have this real estate destruction. Commercial isn't great, don't get me wrong, but commercial is controllable and it rolls a lot slower than residential. So I think that's going to be more sustainable and that can be worked around, especially if rates come down. Now, one thing I wanted to point out here too as well, more recently, you can see how both mortgage and student loan are near record low still. I mean, super, super low. So this is, this is good. It offsets some of the rest of that, which is why the debt balance is so low. And again, this blue line here represents when we were at these similar levels for credit and auto loan delinquencies. Now, again, going back to July, because I don't have more recent data, but it shows that we were in late 2006, heading into 2007, we were around those same levels. It wasn't until October of 2007 when the S&P topped. So... This, if this is true, we still got time. Even if you say that things are getting worse now, we probably still have time. And really, if you look at GDP and all the economic data from Friday, it's not getting worse. Watch my other market wrap up from Friday. Um, it, it looked great. It was actually way better than I expected. So, so again, that's my whole point here is that I don't see anything like what we saw in 2007, 2008 happening right now. All right, I'm going to click in here. Let's see what's next. All right, World Financial Stress Index. This is a this is a good one. So you can see how back in 2008, the U.S. in blue set off those events. Uh, I don't know if you guys know who Lehman Brothers is, but 
there are a bunch of institutions that were trading derivatives and didn't realize their exposure to catastrophe <laughs> and to other banks that were basically just, you know, dying. And, um, and so Lehman started it, but then it was just a cascading series of events and it was a mess and it led to all the Q QE as we know it today, modern day QE, which is just printing endlessly. And uh, we had to do tons of that. We did cash for clunkers. We had all kinds of things that happened back then that that had to happen just to restart the economy and to keep the banking system from collapsing. I don't know if people realize this, but literally over the weekend, they passed bills to flood record liquidity. Back then, it was less than a trillion dollars. It doesn't even sound like anything now. It sounds like a Tuesday. But um, it was like $850 billion or something. And they did that so that the financial system did not collapse the next Monday because they, they were literally looking at banks ceasing and, and, and bank runs starting. That's how bad it was. And you could see how bad it was by how high we went here in this number. It was not good. And we bled into, so we started it, but then you know we maintained well because we provided lots of liquidity and we were the world's reserve currency. And then emerging markets got smoked and absolutely destroyed. If you look here, the world is in yellow and it took a major hit. The only place that did well was China because they had low debt loads at the time. So they were able to, to do really, really well because they had tons of cash. They weren't indebted at all back then. And now they're a freaking mess. So you can see what you can see what happens when you just keep turning on the money printer. You turn into China and you don't want to be China. Um all right. So anyway, we didn't have any major increases. Like we had some ripples here. Uh, it's not really worth talking about, though. Uh, even though it looks like it, it's not. Uh, 2020 obviously shot straight up, but then like everything, it dropped really, really quickly. And so the, like the, as this was spiking up, the market was dropping to severe lows. And then anybody who bought that dip did great. I was not focused on it. Um, I wasn't even focused so much on macro and didn't know a lot about it back then. Really wish I would have. Uh, I would have been much better positioned, and who knows? Maybe I could be at ten million right now, or or higher. That would be awesome. But now it's going to take another year or two to get to that level. So maybe less. Anyway, but uh, this was a blip, and then it disappeared. If you look here, late twenty twenty two, early twenty twenty three, you can see where the problem started again. What's weird with this one is that we can actually see that. The United States was a part of this, and we were causing it because we were having banking collapses here. And so we were the con contagion, but at the same time, we were also the safe haven. And you can see how in blue, the, the, we were underneath here. And so we were under the stress levels for the majority of it, and we're still there now. But we led that. We led the, it's going to be okay. Because we're the cleanest shirt and the dirty laundry. People want to shiv on the U.S. dollar, but... When you compare it to everything else and you look at our world reserve status, we are it. So anyway, my whole point here is I'm not seeing any signs of stress. It looks good. This doesn't give us a lot of time as a predictive indicator at all. Um, but again, it's not bad. This one I love, U.S. bankruptcies. Well, I shouldn't say. I mean, nobody loves bankruptcy. But what's nice about this is you could see where after the pandemic, we had... We, we shortly after we had a spike and we're continuing. We kind of had been trending since like 2019 upwards in our bankruptcies. The pandemic was just a great reason to print a bunch of money. And when it did that, we saw a massive decline in bankruptcies. I think a huge portion of that, not just the checks, but for mortgages, if you had mortgages and you were impacted by the pandemic and yada, 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 whatever the hell it was, you, you could get it to where you didn't have to pay your mortgage for up to two years. A ton of people took that up. I know a bunch. So you could see where, where um, till March 2020, we were just like at record lows on bankruptcies. And that kind of carried over because, again, you can't have bankruptcies if nobody has to pay their mortgage for two years. So, or at least a lot of people don't. So I would expect this big increase after that, right? You had people that were distressed. You had people that were probably spending money they didn't have because they had extra, they didn't have as much debt or they didn't have as much of a recurring monthly payment. Um, and they didn't manage that well. And so they just went under at the end. And so you, this spike was totally normal. The part I love is that from November to December, look at how much this dropped. And uh, I'm hoping to see continuation of this in January, but, but we're really kind of near the median 
of the last you know 15 years and that's not a bad place to be so I, i'm more optimistic on the bankruptcy number than probably a lot of people next part m1 and m2 money supply so real quickly let me just explain what these are so m1 is like cat think of really liquid money like cash uh, deposits travelers checks that's that's what m1 is m2 is less liquid it is like think of time time deposits like in savings accounts where you got to put it in a cd for whatever time uh, certificates to deposit money market funds are really the big rage lately and giving you tons of yield but um but that's the less liquid stuff right we can see that both of these numbers turn down dramatically dramatically um as as the money printer stopped and uh quantitative tightening started to kick in and the fed started hiking rates at the most aggressive rate in history they they just fell through the floor and the bears loved this man they loved seeing how low this number was getting record lows but since july it's been turning up both of them and i'm sure they don't love that but it's a good sign it's just another sign of global liquidity kicking in it's a sign of money changing hands a lot of people like to think money is a zero-sum game like you got to tax the rich and if you do that that's good but it's not it's not because the rich are the ones that help produce the jobs and the ones that help redistribute wealth and if you don't believe in that you need to really sit back and learn something about economics because in keynesian economics and it's not there's problems with keynesian economics for sure inflation through money printing causes a lot of harm it's very evident right now because right now we're, we've got some of the greatest disparities in wealth and it's because the rich own assets that have went up a bunch of value and the poor just got to have higher expenses because they don't own anything so that sucks for them and anybody trying to spend it any differently that's what's happened recently that is the truth but at the same time money velocity is good having rich people that spend money and that hire people is good because when they hire people and they spend money that money gets picked up by businesses or those businesses are able to hire other people and when they do that it allows them to spend money and then they spend money and then the other businesses benefit that and, and then then they spend money and they hire more and everybody benefits from money velocity and that is the whole point behind keynesian economics is that you want to keep an increased rate of of money velocity so that it helps enrich more people and that is a very true point um, i won't go into all the flaws of it and why bitcoin is so needed but again we want to see money velocity and seeing upticks in m1 and m2 is a really good thing so we're happy about that all right what else did i want to cover real quick uh inflation oh i did want to mention this so one of the big problems we have right now in housing is that we're at record lows for existing home sales and with good reason right like we're at levels we saw in the late 70s levels that we saw in the 90s and the reason and we shouldn't be we should be well above that uh just be based upon larger populations and everything else but but we we should be higher we're not because people didn't want to sell their homes when they had like a 2.75 or a three and a quarter or three and a half or 3.75 so that they could get a loan that's seven maybe even eight percent and on a house that's appreciated in value and they could buy a twice as expensive home between their mortgage and how much extra it is and they're basically moving into the same house uh, so nobody's going to do that i mean hopefully most people don't unless they've just gotten really rich and they can upgrade a lot but you're not going to do that because that's dumb. So, so what we've seen in the housing market is a complete freeze of, of existing homes. And so much so that previously new home sales only made up about 10% on average. But in the last couple of years, they've been up closer to 30%. So new home sales, that's why the home builders did so well for a period of time. I, I haven't looked at them lately, but that's why they did so well because they've got so much demand coming their way. And there's no existing home selling. I actually think this latest inflation data, I found something that was really cool. Now, it scares me that we're already down to 1.35% on Truflation. Truflation is the gold standard for understanding inflation information. They aggregate from all the greatest data providers. They they aren't the government, so it's not manipulated. Um, you can see that the government's number is 3.4%, and in this case, it's 1.35. They were actually higher by almost 2% than the government at the peak. 
So these guys, these guys paint much more time sensitive numbers because they get it directly from APIs, which allow them to be able to get it from some of the you know, biggest companies and data aggregators across every sector of our economy. And they get it right away. As quick as the data is updated, they can pull it. So this gives us much better vision. But what I wanted to point out is a couple of things. Under housing, other lodging is plummeting like a rock and actually negative 2.58%. I think this is the Airbnb type stuff. And maybe like uh, hotels, but definitely Airbnb. And they're, they've got earnings coming up. I'm going to be watching those. I also say that because if I go to recreation and culture, these are some of the biggest drops we see in this inflation, latest inflation read. You can see where that's plummeted from 2.32 down to 1.19. And we could be in the red on this too. So I actually, it gives me a theory that Airbnbs are starting to get squeezed and they're seeing lower revenues and we can see the recreation sector dropping down. And if that's true, we should see it in their earnings coming up. I wouldn't short because I don't short or go long into earnings. That's a stupid way to lose a bunch of money with options. But uh, because interest is too high and that means the premiums are high and it means you get less extrinsic value and you can just bleed out quicker. It's Again, it's just dumb. Don't do it around busy times where there's a lot of interest from other people. But uh, but might be a good indicator of a loosening up in Airbnbs and maybe potential for them selling those. And I would argue that if they are, if we start seeing more people forced to sell them, sure, they, we might see more bankruptcy from individuals um, that are having to liquidate these things. That might be a, an offshoot of that too. But I do believe though, like that can be restructured. It will be good for the housing market, which is continuing to see increases in prices. If we look here, uh, not home sold, um, new new listing median price. We're at record numbers already right now. So we're seeing that that year after year, this 2024 number, we're seeing that prices just keep going up. They just keep going up. And that is not good. It is not what we want to see. Um, new listing median price. This is a good. So in some cases, we're seeing drop prices. But look at this. Back in 2021, we were at... 295 for the median new listing price. Now, fast forward to 2024 and we're at 392. That is a $105,000 increase over that period of time. That's just crazy. And again, this isn't great. This isn't great for the economy when housing becomes unaffordable for more and more and more and more people. So I think seeing some of these Airbnbs may potentially have weakness soon might actually help the housing market. Even if the Fed doesn't lower right away in, in, in March, it might just help the housing mar market because there's going to be more openings. Um, and I, I want to see that. Let's see here. Let's look, see if there's anything else here. New listings, median, new listings. Let's see, if, is that increasing? Hey, that's actually, so that's better than 2023. Still kind of over the last couple of years, a little bit lower, but not substantially lower. So maybe we'll see um, year over year, we're actually seeing an increase. So maybe we'll see uh, some better numbers here in, in 2024 from new listings. That's my theory. And I think it'll happen for both of those reasons. So I think it'll happen from the Fed lowering rates. And I think it'll also happen from some weakness in the Airbnb type sector where they're going to have to start selling these things and start um, putting them back out into the market. So what did we cover? We covered M1 and the fact that it's expanding along with global liquidity. We can see that over here too in our global liquidity cycle chart. This is from Cross Border Capital, my man, my, Michael Howell. He's brilliant. He's one of the reasons I made 700% last year. Between him and Trueflation, I was able to see what was real and that made me a ton of money. And so this is why I love to focus on the big picture. Macro first, that's your base of your mountain. And then fundamentals is that next required step. Then you get into TA. Then you start looking at timing and options. But it's in that order. You don't, you don't, you don't do it in any other order. You gotta understand the base layer first because that means if, the, if you're right about the base, it means your chance of success is exponentially higher. So think about stuff like that. But if you look here, you can see peak. Or you can see trough, peak, trough, peak, trough, peak, trough, peak, trough. A little bit delayed and kind of weird, peak, perfectly on. Low trough, peak, low trough, peak, low trough, peak, low trough, low peak, trough, peak, trough. These last, perfect, going back up. So this global liquidity cycle is really, really accurate going back over 50 years. 
And again, think about what's happening right now. We will be printing. We've got the, you know, we've got the election coming up here in this country, but we've got the most elections in recent history across a multitude of nations and across the world. You got China putting 270, 275 billion U.S. dollars just to prop up their markets. You're going to see so much money flowing out there. It's going to be hard to keep markets down. So keep that stuff in mind. Um, let's see, what else did we cover here? We covered bankruptcies aren't looking that bad. That's recent data. The World Financial Stress Index is looking good. Uh, we covered, I need to get better data here. So I'll see if I can find that for delinquencies, uh, serious delinquencies. We know the auto sector is getting crushed. Uh, real estate's getting crushed. All these sectors are probably not doing as well as this chart might represent. But that's it. I think that's it for today. I just wanted to make sure that, again, I was in and fear and greed. Uh, fear and greed is great. Um, I'm not hating this number on fear and greed. I don't know where it is. I had it in here somewhere. Anyway. Oh, there we go. Fear and greed looks great. I love, I love that bullish divergence that we're starting to see in there. I think that there's a lot of positives in front of us. I think that the economy can be really strong and that what we really need to see is the Fed just give the markets a break. Give us the 25 bips. Give it to us in March when people don't expect it. Or maybe if we get the economic data to get us to 51% and then do it and then, and then it's easily justified because it's not shocking to markets. But if you don't think that the Fed is capable of pivoting Jerome Powell, remember this. Inflation is transitory. And then within a couple of months, the fastest rate hike in history. Ever. I would argue that he's very capable of pivoting. And I, that's what I think my base case is. I think that's what's going to happen. Anyway, love you guys. Probably going to do some more videos if I got this to work right. Um, so you can expect some more stuff coming out. And hopefully this will work on live streams too so I can start doing my daily recap. And I would love to see you guys there. Please like, subscribe, ring the bell, and uh, and and join if you want to help support the channel. Uh, any Every little bit helps. And I want to do a lot more of these. So I'd really appreciate it. Anyway, you guys have a great weekend. Talk to you later.